Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, so before I begin, I just wanted to um, uh, make a comment, which is, whoops, uh, which is uh, the, so we had the evening session last night, and it didn't work out quite the way I expected, which is, I, I thought there would be one person and a bunch of people could be uh, doing what that one person was doing. Uh, for those of you who were there, you know it was different. It was a bunch of different little groups, but from what everybody, what I've heard from everyone I talked to, it was quite productive. And so I think we'll we'll try it again tonight, and we'll have uh, uh, different people there with different kinds of expertise, and you're free to walk around and talk to whoever you want to. So I hope that was useful. Um, Here's, I'm just reminding people about the reading list page, and you should maybe keep an eye on it uh, because I'm occasionally updating it. Down here at the bottom, there's uh, some notes that I'm posting. So in particular, uh, I was reminded that David's talk today that uh, a couple of years ago I made an SL2 ref card. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with ref cards, this is something from computer science where you, you put all of the essential commands uh, for some programming language, say, on a single piece of paper. So this is an SL2 ref card. Uh, and it's, it's more or less um, illegible, I suppose, on the screen, but um, you, can, you can download it and look at it. And all of these formulas that David was talking about and more are found on here. And uh, naturally, the convention is slightly different from the one David was using. But, um, I recommend you take a look at this. Okay. the second talk in my series. And uh, so I'm going to start off with um, a little bit more detail about uh, root data. I talked about that in my computer lecture yesterday. Uh, I just want to say it. Uh, um, but, uh, it it's largely for notation. Um, so our starting point is a connected complex reductive group. And there are a couple of examples there to refresh your memory. And uh, there's a beautiful theory that a reductive group is classified by its root datum. And um, we're going to, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with this concept. And here's a reference, a uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful book by uh, Bourbaki. And I've actually posted the, um, the relevant part on the website Although the PDF I had was only for the French version, so if you like the English version, you'll have to um, dig that up. But um, it's one of the amazing theorems to me. Uh, it's in some sense the theorem which makes the Atlas project possible, which is reductive groups are complicated. And there's all sorts of isogenies and extensions and all this, that, and the other thing. And you're, uh, you may be familiar with the theory of root systems, that, that root systems can classify uh, Semi-simple Lie algebras are classified by their root system. But it's an amazing thing, in fact, that if you want to extend this to classify, <coughs> excuse me, reductive groups, um, you need this slightly more general thing called the root data, and uh, it works perfectly. So I'll say a little bit about it. But as I said, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details. I'm going to assume people are familiar with this. So we're given our group G, complex group G. You choose a Cartan subgroup. And you let <clears throat> x upper star of h, which will abbreviate x upper star, let that be the algebraic uh, one-dimensional representations of h. And that's a lattice. It's zn. And you let x lower star be the, the maps from c cross into h. That's also a lattice of the same rank, zn. <clears throat> and these are really fundamental objects. These are sort of built in right at the very beginning. These are behind the scenes in everything we do. There's a perfect pairing uh, between these two lattices and Z. And in deference to Mark, 
I changed my slides this morning and I wrote it, I picked the lower star on the left and the next upper star on the right. And here's how it's defined, which is uh, if you have a co-character and you want to pair with a character, the answer is N. And the N is the one where if you compose the two of them, you get a character of C cross, and that's uh, by that's raising to some nth power, and that's the N which in the pairing. So it's an elementary de definition. And uh, contained in X upper star is the set of roots, and contained in X uh, lower star is the set of co-roots. And these are both finite sets, and they're in bijection, bijection, excuse me, by a, a map alpha goes to alpha check. And among other things, this map satisfies this condition. And of course, it's violated my, my, my uh, <laughs> violated my convention here by writing it in the other order. Um, uh, alpha paired with alpha check is equal to two. And so <clears throat> here's my first dangerous bed. Um, X upper star and X lower star are both Zn, but you should never identify them. And this was a mistake I made for about 20 years as a subject, um, uh, using the bilinear form and confusing roots and co-roots, and uh, it held me back. Um, the roots live in X upper star, co-roots live in X lower star, and they're just different places. Don't 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 ever think of don't ever identify a root with a uh, co-root with some multiple of a root. And uh, these two spaces are naturally dual to each other. Okay. So there's this pairing from uh, uh, between them. So I, mean, I talked about this yesterday in my computer lecture in Atlas. Uh, <clears throat> both x lower star and x upper star are given by n tuples of integers. And in, in other words, the software is choosing a basis of Zn, and then A1 through An is, is an element of x lower star in this basis, and similarly an element of x upper star. And um, the pairing is simply the dot product. And as I said yesterday, you should really think of this as B being a row vector and W being the column vector, and you take the product. Um, now, the problem is the software doesn't, the software is flexible. You can multiply two row vectors. And so it won't prevent you from computing, for example, V star B, the inner product of B with itself. And although this does occasionally come up, uh, usually that's not what you want. And one of the, the biggest sources of errors that I've had over the years in programming analysis is being sloppy about this and confusing a root and a co-root, and um, uh, anyway, just, just this, this, this issue here. So as Mark said yesterday, we could, and maybe we will at some point, enforce uh, a convention that, that elements of x lower star are rows, and x elements of x upper star are columns, and really have that be a distinction. But at the moment, that's not good. All right, so um, if you go back and you read Springer, uh, um, I, I mentioned um, uh, uh, the, the, the theorem that I mentioned about, well, I didn't state it, but reductive groups are classified by their root datum. And if you read Springer and then run it through the computer and come out the other side, it turns out that you can, a uh, root datum is simply the following thing. It's a pair of n by n integral matrices A, B, where n is the rank of the group, which is the dimension of the torus, which is to say x upper, is the rank of this x upper star, and m is the semi-simple rank, which is the dimension of the span of the roots, which might be less. If the group is semi-simple, they're, they're equal if and only if the group is semi-simple. And these two matrices have to satisfy simply the condition transpose B times A is a Cartan matrix of size m by m. And this blew me away when I first saw it. Uh, I've, you know, I've been working with reductive groups for many years, and the fact that it boils down to such a simple uh, combinatorial description is really quite amazing. And uh, there's an equivalence. I'm not going to spell out the entire equivalence, but the main 
um, uh, the main thing you need for the notion of equivalence is a change of basis, which is um, you can replace A, B uh, using a change of basis matrix in GL2Z has this effect on these two matrices. GL2Z. Huh? GL2Z. Excuse me. GLNZ. Um, and uh, A, I, I forgot to say this, A is the, um, I should have written that on the slide, um, A is uh, R1 divided by Rn, uh, the rank Rn line. The columns are the, um, are the, uh, the simple roots. And B is the columns are the simple codes. Okay. And I, I we looked at a couple of examples of these yesterday. And anyway, that's that's a uh, um, that, that's the starting point for the Atlas software. Uh, one the main I said wound up saying a few more words here than I was planning to. In some sense, the main thing I wanted to introduce was this X upper star and X lower star. Uh, but anyway, um, this other stuff's important. And I thought I would do one example. Suppose you have a, a reductive group whose rank is two. That means it has a two-dimensional torus, but its semi-simple rank is one, meaning it only has a single root. And the question is, uh, how many such groups are there? That's not so easy to figure out by hand. But if you do it in terms of root data, well, there's this root data which it turns out uh, it gives you the group SL2 plus GL1. And this is two, two uh, written in an atlas notation. So this is the root and this is the co-root. And if you take the dot product of the two, then you get two. And similarly here, the root and the co-root. And this is the um, PSL2. And a third example is this, the dot product of those two vectors is two. And that corresponds to um, GL2. And that's it. But there are only, up to isomorphism, there are three reductive groups, the rank two and semi simple rank one. And that's the proof. And um, it, so that's an exercise. I strongly recommend people work this out. There's some very interesting linear algebra over Z that goes into it. In particular, this is a perfectly good root data. The dot product of these two vectors is two. Oh, I lost the sign. <laughs> Uh, I think it's minus 334, sorry. Uh, and what group is that? That's, if, if, if you do this exercise, you'll have learned a lot about group data. All right, questions? I, I, I just did this example to, to show, show off the mark that I can do the Euclidean algorithm also. <laughs> All right, so um, we're given our connected complex reductive group, and we're going to fix a Cartan subgroup. And that gives us this root data. Um, and the root data is x upper star, x lower star, this set, this set R and R check. Uh, we're also going to always fix a Borel subgroup. And fixing a Borel subgroup containing the Cartan is the same thing as choosing a set of positive roots. And that's the same thing as choosing a set of simple roots. And that gives rise to the notion of a base root datum, which is the G, B, and H together give you uh, X upper star, the set of simple roots, X lower star, and the set of simple co-roots. And that is um, really what I was writing down here. Um, it's really a base root datum. <laughs> and uh, it, to, in Atlas, a complex group is exactly the same thing as a base group data. Um, now, recall. What are we going to recall? Ah, uh, yes, the Atlas point of view is that H and B are fixed forever, and theta and K, everything else can vary. And that's relevant here because everything here is fixed. And so you can safely talk about the root data and not worry about which Cartan and which Borel you're talking about. Okay, so now I want to talk about KGB. So, 
Um, it's, 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 I think the relevant point is in, in a root agent, we never change the point of view of which are the simple and positive groups. You choose a root agent. Yes. And some roots are positive, others are negative, and they never change. Absolutely. That's right. So for us, we fix the set of simple roots once and for all. And root number three, there's no question which root you're talking about. And the carton might be moving, the, the, the K is moving around, the other things are varying, but you can count on root number three being completely uh, well defined. So since uh, that is, is changing the world, changing the Absolutely. So um, in, in, in varying theta, one of, the, one of the things we're going to do, and I'll, this, this is going to come up shortly, is in, instead of moving h, you're going to vary the real form of, of the, the fixed carton, h. Okay? All right, so, I, so now I want to talk about KGB. And this is, uh, in some sense, the heart of the Atlas algorithm. Uh, this is a combinatorial calculation which lies on, which is the heart of everything. Once you've figured out KGB, uh, the rest is gravy. So we're going to start with our complex group G and our real form sigma, but we're going to, for, um, and, and so that the real group is G, G over sigma, but we're going to forget about sigma, of course, and replace it with theta, and, and think about K being G over theta, as I talked about last time. So really the basic object is theta, and I'm just reminding you, everything is complex from now on, unless stated otherwise. And uh, G mod B is a projective variety. It's the, it's the set of Borel subgroups. And um, for motivation, David's been talking about category O. The geometry behind category O is this double coset space uh, B acting on G mod B, or the double coset space B mod G mod B as written. Uh, that's isomorphic to W, the vial group. And, well, first of all, that's finite. And obviously the, the, the vial group has a lot of rich structure, and everything about the vial group informs category O. And a lot of calculations in category O become calculations in the vial group. <clears throat> we want to do something like that in the setting of GK modules. So obviously K has, has to have something to do with it. And uh, in fact, K is everything. The G is a complex V algebra. Um, that's, that's, that doesn't see anything about the real form. Everything about the real form is specified by K. And so it turns out that the natural object is you look at this double coset space K mod G mod B. So it's the K orbits, uh, uh, it's the orbits of K acting on B. Uh, I, I didn't write B on the slides, but um, B is the set of Borel subgroups. And um, sometimes I like writing B because, well, B, script B, is in bijection with G mod B, but this right hand side requires a choice. The set of Borel subgroups is canonical. I mean, it's nice to say things that way, but anyway. Um, the, and, and K acts on it by conjugation. If you have a Borel subgroup, an element of K, you act by conjugation, you get another Borel subgroup. That's the action that we're considering. And once you've, um, and, and so that's this space KGB. The, the right hand side here, K orbits of, G, K act, orbits of K acting on B, which is to say the exact same thing as K conjugacy classes of Borel's, this right-hand side doesn't depend on the choice of B. When on left-hand side, you've chosen B, and these two spaces are in the Okay? Uh, it's a theorem that just like B acts on G my view in finally many, finally many orbits, so does K. So this goes back to, I was trying to track down the actual history of this result. Um, I think it's accurate to say that the idea goes back to Joe Wolf, who's sitting here in the front row, um, uh, in the 60, 1969, slightly different version. Um, as stated here, I think it's pro proper to attribute it to Matsuki, 
but um, certainly goes back to, 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 to Joe's results. Uh, okay. Um, so we've got an interesting combinatorial problem here. Um, parametrize the set KGB. And that's a finite problem. And as I said last time, I'm working on a computer, so I definitely want to stick to finite problems when I can. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. Um, strictly speaking, um, this depends on the choice of K. Well, not strictly speaking. <laughs> um, it, it does depend on the choice of K. But uh, it's not possible, if you have two different Ks which are conjugate, it's still not necessarily possible to canonically identify these spaces. So there's really some choice here in, in, uh, um, in, in what I'm saying. So oftentimes in the atlas, we're a little bit vague about what we mean by K. And most of the time, it doesn't matter. But every once in a while, in order to be precise, we're going to have to specify the K. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But, but you just said that it's and then it's changing. Yes. Well, that's right, and so I'll come back to that. So in, in order, that's exactly right. So if, if you couldn't hear, the question was, we're going to be varying K, and that's absolutely correct. And so um, I, I have two different Ks, and I have their KGB spaces, and they're in bijection because the Ks are conjugate, but they're not canonically in bijection. So what I have to do is I have to fix a K and refer everything back to that. And I'll come back to that. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's take SL2R in the, in the version of SU11 where the diagonal is. Uh, um. So I think that what you mean is that all the computer, if you want to fix one KGB space, then you need to see the information. You want one R, this is what? Why do you need to identify the Um. Because, uh, so the, 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 the way we think about these representations is um, I, I'm, I'm, going to param I'm going to be parameterizing representations of a given real group in terms of some combinatorial data involving elements of this KGB space. And um, these, these, as you vary this element of the KGB space, you're varying the K. And so in order to uh, actually identify these as representations of a single group, you have to pick the base point. So, um, just that. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll see examples of this in a few minutes. Um, so let's work, let's work with SU11, the diagonal carton. The G mod B I mentioned is a projective variety, in this case it's CP1, which I'm going to write as C union infinity. And the diagonal acts by multiplication by z squared. And uh, the way my mnemonic for remembering that it's z squared and not z is that the identity acts trivially. And z squared guarantees that that's the case. And um, so the orbits, there are three of them. There's zero, infinity, and c cross. A single open orbit and two closed orbits. Uh, in terms of the Borel subgroups, um, the zero orbit corresponds to the fixed Borel, and let's say we've chosen the, um, the upper Borel as being our, uh, our, base, our base point. So implicit in this first sentence is that this is B, and then this is the, the end point at infinity corresponds to the opposite Borel, and then C crosses all other, all other uh, Borel subgroups. Um, well, right here I fixed K, so I, at some point I am going to be varying K, but for now I'm, I'm, I'm simply taking K to be the diagonal matrices. So uh, yes, this, this is an uh, accident that K equals H. No, no. Um, well, this is a small example, and we'll, we'll, we'll anyway the, the the different K is 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 not manifesting itself yet. That'll be in a minute. For now, it's 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 not. Yes. The identity should not act. No, minus the identity should act trivially. Oh, minus. 
Oh, I'm sorry, did I say the identity? Don't listen to me. <laughs> other, other silly questions. All right. Uh, well, so this business about um, choices, I mean, there is something lurking here, which is these two points are kind of, you could kind of switch them by changing the Borel to the opposite Borel. That's part of the issue. Anyway, um, so, well, so, okay, so this is just a simple example to show that this is a finite set, and there it is. And the, uh, the first thing, one of the first things the software does is compute this, a parameter space for this, this set KPD. And in order to explain that, I'm going to uh, assume that theta is an inner automorphism. I mentioned this notion last time. This is to say that we're talking about the compact inner class. Uh, I haven't introduced the inner class concept yet, but um, so it doesn't really matter. All that matters for now is that theta is inner. And this is just for convenience. Um, at the end, I'll give the general statement, but just to avoid saying a lot of extra words, I'm going to assume this. So here's the theorem. Um, suppose you're given a group in the compact inner class, and you fix a Cartan involution. So then this Cartan involution, theta, well, by assumption, it's conjugation by some element in G. That's the inner class assumption. And the fact that theta is an involution is equivalent to just saying that the square of this element is central. And after conjugating by G, uh, I can assume that this element is actually in H. Well, with that. And Let's do that, and then let's let k be the central. So then uh, k is g of the theta, which is to say it's the centralizer of this element, x naught. So this x naught is this base point I was talking about earlier. Then here's the beautiful theorem. The uh, the space KGB is in canonical bijection with the following set. It's the elements of the normalizer of H such that x is g conjugate to this x naught. And all of that is mod modulo conjugation by h. So this modulo h is, might be a little bit mis uh, confusing. It's not a subgroup, it's, it's conjugation by h. All right, so let's unpack this briefly. So the normalizer of h, well, that's the thing that comes up when you construct the bottle group. This is the thing that maps onto the bottle group. And so we're talking about elements mapping to the bottle group. And um, we, we want the ones which are conjugate to x naught. And I'll do an example in a minute. But this is a finite set. And well, after you mod, after you, after you mod it out by h, this side is finite. And um, it, there's a bijection here. And it's specifically this k, maybe I should have written k sub x naught, to emphasize that the k on this side is the one uh, which is the centralizer of this x naught. Okay. Yes. So that's just that theta is inner. Theta is an inner automorphism. Um. Sorry. The, I mean, sorry. What's the question? Yes. Yes. No, that, that's okay. <laughs> it's a good question, but it's, it's okay. Um, all right. So uh, this set is very computable. Um, uh, so notice that, uh, just to get, get, get a sense of it, uh, there's a map from this set to the set of involutions in the bottle group, taking this element x to its image in the bottle group. There's a, the normalizer of H, actually modulo H itself, the subgroup, that's an element of the bottle group. And the fact that X squared is central says that this X squared in the, in the bottle group is an involution. So the set of involutions in the bottle group, that's a very beautiful combinatorial object. You can think about that in lots of different ways. And this set is closely related to that. In fact, the fibers of the map to the involutions in the bottle group 
are, I said, essentially finite. Well, actually, the way I've written down things here, I think it's literally finite. Um, I think that's correct, anyway. Uh, uh, pardon me? Uh, well, okay, so the reason I said essentially finite is um, if, the, if the group has, I think, a compact torus in the center, there's like some silly stuff having to do with the center, but uh, ignore that. The, I think the way I've written the, it, it's, it's, it's fine. It, it's absolutely fine. The software was sometimes computing <coughs> the set for a bunch of different thetas at the same time. And right. when you do that, yeah. the, there's the danger of having I mean, Yeah, so it, as long as I put this, this x time to get to x not here, you can remove the word essentially. This is fine. All right, so let's go back and look at our example of uh, SL2. So uh, um, x naught, I'm going to take to be the diagonal i minus i. x naught squared is minus 1. And so let's just compute this set, the elements of the normalizer of h. Ah, um, uh, I, 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 I wrote this, which actually does turn out to be the same, but I, I shouldn't have said that. Um, uh, um, it's the set of x. So that x is conjugate x naught minus of h. Um, it, it turns out in this case it, um, it's the same exact condition, but that really um, this is what we're computing. Uh, so what's the normalizer of h? Well, there's h itself. So um, so the question is: suppose you have an element of h. Uh, what are the elements of h which are conjugate to h naught? Well, just h naught and minus h naught, which is to say i minus i and negative it, is the negative of it. So there are two elements. And h acting on, by conjugation on itself is trivial, so there's nothing else to mod out by. So there are two elements, those two right there. Uh, case two, x is not in h. Well, the, the normalizer of h has two components. The other one, is these matrices 0, z minus 1 over z, 0. And we only want the ones which are conjugate to i minus i. Well, it turns out they're all conjugate to i minus i. The eigenvalues of this matrix are, uh, the, the eigenvalues of this matrix are i minus i independent of z. So all of those x's are allowed. And notice that x squared is also minus 1. Put the 1 to the right. And uh, here's an easy exercise. All of those elements are conjugate by H. If you, uh, uh, if you conjugate this matrix by the appropriate diagonal matrix, you can change Z to anything else. So after modding out by that conjugation, um, uh, well, they're all conjugate and they have the same square. Uh, after modding out by that, you can just take one of them, and of course, the convenient one is to take this, 